Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I am here with a very overdue wrap-up video. So if you've watched my recent Paper Crane Conversations video, you know that I have not been filming in a while and I am woefully behind on wrap-up videos. So today I'm going to talk about what I read in the fall months of September, October, and November. Most of what I read is no longer in my possession and is either back at the library or just elsewhere right now. So sit back, relax, maybe make yourself a cup of tea. This is going to be quite a long video and potentially it's going to be split into two videos. We shall see. But on to the books. September was a pretty good reading month for me and I was very excited that I actually finished all of the books that I wanted to read in September before Victober started. The first book that I finished in the month of September was What Should Be Wild by Julia Fine. This is a fairly impressive debut novel. I saw it in the library and I was completely taken in by the inside cover and the premise of the book. It's about a girl named Maisie Cafe who was born with the power to kill or resurrect the living with her touch. She grows up sequestered from society with her father in the family's ancestral home, bordering a mysterious forest. Men are known to disappear within the wood and emerge, dazed and confused, telling strange stories. Maisie's father does not tell her that she is part of a long line of cursed women. For over a millennium, her female ancestors have also disappeared into the wood, but they never emerge. When Maisie's father disappears, Maisie must emerge from seclusion to find him, and in doing so, she confronts her power and her ancestry. The premise is original and intriguing, full of gothic tropes and dark fairy tale elements. The plot, mystery, mythology, and dark, beautiful prose carried me swiftly through this book but I couldn't help feeling like there was something slightly off in its execution. It was just such an exquisite concept for a book, but it fell short of perfect for me. It bounces back and forth between Maisie's story and the stories of her ancestors, the women who have disappeared into this forest. I love the ancestors' stories, and I felt that they could have been better fleshed out as characters. I also personally thought that the ending was a bit rushed and that some of the mythology was a little unclear and the rationale for how things ended up working out at the end didn't quite make sense to me. And while the father's character was beautifully executed, I thought that the other two male characters in the book that uh, Maisie meets towards the middle portion were a bit flat and underdeveloped. Still, this book was an enchanting and haunting experience and I would highly recommend it for the fall time of year or even the winter actually. And I'd recommend it for anyone who is intrigued by the plot or is a fan of mythology, fairy tales, fantasy, or mystery genres. Like I said, it's an impressive debut novel, and I'd be really interested to see what Julia Fine writes next. In September, I also read Watchmen for the first time. My boyfriend has been trying to get me to read this book for years at this point, and I am so glad that I finally listened to him. It is critically acclaimed and one of the most, if not the most, influential graphic novels of all time, and it really paved the way for graphic novels as an accepted and acknowledged genre. How do I even begin to explain what this book is about? It takes place in the 1980s during the Cold War, but in an alternate version of our world where superheroes used to protect society but have now fallen from grace and are outlawed. The series opens with the mysterious and gruesome death of one of the old superheroes, the comedian, and a vigilante, Rorschach, who is looking into the comedian's death. The concept of superheroes is carefully examined as the heroes are stalked by an unknown killer. This book brilliantly examines politics, humanity, and our perceptions of the world around us. It deals with ethical dilemmas and the concept of nuclear war and asks, is it acceptable to sacrifice some people in order to attain a greater good? Watchmen incorporates ideas from philosophy and literature, Nietzsche, Shakespeare, and Shelley. But perhaps the most impressive thing about this graphic novel is how well it has aged. Current affairs have come a long way since the Cold War, but this graphic novel touches on many of the same issues that are relevant in today's media, including sexual assault, media manipulation, mental illness, and homophobia. It's almost as if Alan Moore, the author, has predicted the future in terrifying ways. And the characters are brilliant and complex works of art. Dr. Manhattan, in obvious reference to the Manhattan Project during World War II, is a godlike being who can control the world on a molecular level. 
he could end the world with a snap of his fingers if he wanted to, but who really controls him and what motivates his actions? Ozymandias, named for Shelley's poem, is a retired superhero turned billionaire businessman. He's fascinating to think about, but if I said too much more about him, I think I'd ruin the entire plot of Watchmen for you. And then there is Rorschach, who is arguably the most interesting character to examine. He's a brilliant anti-hero, a vigilante, erratic, enigmatic, and ruled by his own twisted sense of morality. There is an amazing video about his identity issues and the power of a superhero's mask, which I will link down below um, so you guys can check it out in your own time. I'd like to say that one of my favorite quotes that is said by Rorschach is as follows. Existence is random, has no pattern save what we imagine after staring at it for too long, no meaning save what we choose to impose. This rudderless world is not shaped by vague metaphysical forces. It is not God who kills the children, not fate that butchers them, or destiny that feeds them to the dogs. It's us, only us. Streets stank a fire, the void breathed hard on my heart, turning its illusions to ice, shattering them was reborn then, free to scrawl own design on this morally blank world. So as you can probably tell by my mini discussion of this book, this is not an uplifting read. It's dark and depressing and full of moral questions and ambiguities, but it's brilliant and thought-provoking and something that I truly think everyone should read at some point in their lives. Next in September, I read Manhattan Beach by Jennifer Egan. I've been dying to read something by Jennifer Egan for a while, and after reading this, I'm eager to delve into more of her works. Manhattan Beach is historical fiction set in Brooklyn during World War II. The book starts with 12-year-old Anna, who accompanies her father on a business outing to meet a man named Dexter Stiles. Years later, America is in the throes of World War II, and Anna's father has mysteriously disappeared. Anna works in the Brooklyn Naval Yard, where women are allowed to hold jobs once exclusively reserved for men, and ends up meeting Dexter Stiles again. As Anna begins to unravel the complexities of her father's disappearance, her life becomes intertwined with Dexter Stiles's and his world of gangsters, unions, and bankers. I found this book to be a refreshing take on World War II. Oftentimes, when I read a book related to World War II, I feel like I've already heard that story told very similarly before. But Egan's book sheds light on the American home front during World War II in a way that no other piece of fiction I've read before does. The changing roles of women in the workplace and how women contributed to the home front war effort was thoroughly explored through Anna's struggle to become the first female diver, as well as her interactions with her co-workers, both male and female. I was also intrigued by the depiction of disability in Manhattan Beach. Anna's sister, Lydia, is wheelchair-bound and almost non-verbal. Based on the book's description, I personally think that she has a severe case of cerebral palsy, though that's never explicitly stated. It was interesting to see how each family member viewed and interacted with Lydia. Anna's mother babies and pampers her, her father views her as a burden, and Anna's viewpoints of her sister fluctuate drastically throughout the book. There is an element of Lydia's treatment in her book that is problematic. She is almost used as a symbol and plot device rather than a character in her own right. Still, to have a character with a developmental disability where the book is not exclusively focused on that character and their condition is something that I find quite rare in contemporary fiction. Overall, this book had so many interesting elements, but it seemed to fall short of perfect for me. I felt like this book was a bit drawn out and meandering, that the plot, though it did eventually come together in fascinating ways, was a bit disjointed. Still, the book is beautifully written and quite thought-provoking. People who are a fan of Egan's work generally recommend some of her other books more than this one, so I can't wait to read more of her writing soon. She's clearly such a talented author. If you have read Jennifer Egan's work, I'd be curious to know what you'd recommend I read next by her. I have heard of A Visit from the Goon Squad, and Invisible Circus, I think it is. Um, but for some reason, when I read the backs of her books, they just don't intrigue me. But I absolutely love her writing. So yes, what would you recommend by Jennifer Egan? Um, now I'm going to take a little break because the heater is kicking in and is making a lot of background noise. All right, so the heat has finally settled down and I worked on my knitting a little in the meantime. But anyway, 
So the last book that I finished in the month of September was The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. This was a reread for me and the more I think about it, the more this book is probably my favorite contemporary fiction book of all time. This reread was just as good as the first time I read the book, if not better, because I could put the plot aside and really pay attention to the gorgeous language. It was also fun to discover little clues and foreshadowing as to the twist of the book. Thirteenth Tale is about a famous and prolific author named Vita Winter, who is notorious for keeping her personal life private and is constantly fabricating alternative life stories for the press. Vita, elderly and ill, calls on Margaret Lee, a young biographer, to finally share the truth of her secretive and tragic past. Margaret and the reader unravel a mesmerizing and touching story complete with gothic strangeness, feral twins, a ghost, a governess, a garden, and a devastating fire. This book is very Victorian and has gorgeous prose. It has all the standard gothic tropes, multiple generations, an abusive, mad, patriarchal figure, an old grand house, stories within stories, lost manuscripts, or actually multiple lost manuscripts because when you think of it there's the governess's journal and the missing 13th tale and the torn page of Jane Eyre and I think you could even see the partial writing on Ambrose's bag as a lost manuscript. Anyway this book is perfect for fans of Jane Eyre or Rebecca. I just adore this book so much. It has one of the best plot twists of all time and I just want to thrust it into everyone's hands. My only disappointment was that I discovered that I like a different cover better than the one I own and that is incredibly petty and I'm not usually one to care about the cover I own plus this is really pretty and has books all over it. But Katie from Books and Things did a spectacular and very spoilery reading of a different book cover. I'll insert a picture of that. She just describes how ingenious that cover is and how it perfectly encapsulates the book, plot twist and all. But of course, now that I've marked all my favorite passages in this book, it's extra special to me, and so I will leave you with one of my favorite passages from The Thirteenth Tale. And trust me, it was very hard to just pick one for you. There is something about words in expert hands, manipulated deftly. They take you prisoner wind themselves around your limbs like spider silk and when you are so enthralled you cannot move they pierce your skin enter your blood numb your thoughts inside you they work their magic so that was what i read in the month of september now on to my october victober reads i did not read quite as much as i had hoped to for victober i had quite a bit going on in my personal life and i had extra responsibilities at work but i did manage to read some really great victorian literature the most exciting part of victober for me was that i finally finally finished our mutual friend by charles dickens which i have been reading on and off for about a year and a half i think I posted a whole video in October about my experience reading it in a serialized fashion, which I will link above and below for you to take a look at if you haven't watched it already. But even though I didn't love the serialized reading, I absolutely loved Our Mutual Friend. The book and its multiple plots center around the death of Mr. Harmon and the legacy of his fortune, which was financed by profitable mounds of dust or garbage. He basically owned garbage heaps and made money off of any valuables that were discovered there. Harmon's will stipulates that his estranged son, John Harmon, stands to inherit his fortune on the condition that he marry a stranger named Bella Wilfer. But in the very opening of the book, John Harmon, the expected heir, is discovered dead in the Thames River. Who will control Mr. Harmon's fortune and who killed John Harmon? The book untangles a large cast of characters who are all closely or distantly affected by the death of John Harmon and in doing so this book provides a brilliant analysis and satire of Victorian society including the importance of money, respectability, marriage, and so much more. It has a great cast of characters. I love Jenny Wren, who is a doll's dressmaker with a disability, and though she is a child, she is forced to take on the role of an adult, as her father is an irresponsible drunkard. 
There's Bradley Headstone, the schoolmaster whose story takes a very dark trajectory as he falls from respectability. There's Lizzie Hexham, a strong female heroine who subverts the standard damsel in distress narrative. There are just so many great characters and the way they all relate to each other in this book is fascinating. It is such a phenomenal book. I also watched the Our Mutual Friend 1998 BBC adaptation, which is spectacularly done. The way it portrays the stark differences between the classes with the use of shadowing and darks and lights is brilliant. There is one beautiful transitory scene where there's this pristine white dog lapping milk from a silver dish and everything is bright and white and shiny and then the camera cuts to the darkness and dirt of the dust heaps. And then as all of the characters become more and more intertwined and it becomes clear that respectability and morality is not entirely linked with class, the differences in the lights and the darks become less drastic and less noticeable. It's really quite brilliantly done. There are also a lot of famous actors. Bradley Headstone is portrayed by the same actor who plays Colonel Brandon in one of the BBC Sense and Sensibility adaptations. Bella Wilfer is played by Anna Friel, the same actress who is Chuck in Pushing Daisies, which is one of my favorite TV shows. And Rogue Riderhood is the same actor who is Filch in the Harry Potter movies. And Mr. Venus is the actor who plays Wormtail. So there are so many major differences between the book and the movie, but this adaptation is still really wonderful. This Victober, I also reread, or rather listened to Wives and Daughters on audiobook. Wives and Daughters is definitely one of my favorite books of all time. I think it is Gaskell's masterpiece. And because this video is already pretty long, I am not going to rave about it here. But if you're interested in hearing about how wonderful Wives and Daughters is, you can check out my in-depth video all about Wives and Daughters, which I'll link above and below from the first time that I read the book. Speaking of Gaskell, I also read Elizabeth Gaskell's Mary Barton for the first time in October. I did it as a buddy read with Petra from Petra U, which was a lot of fun. Mary Barton is about the titular character, Mary Barton, and her life in the working class of Manchester. She is the pretty daughter of a factory worker, and she's torn between two suitors. Her childhood friend, Jem, who is a stable worker, and Henry Carson, the mill owner's charming son. But when union politics turn ugly, a murder occurs and Mary's loyalties are tested to their limits. It's a book all about workers' rights, unions, and class strife in Victorian England, but it also discusses and warns how easy it is to fall out of respectability in working class society. I greatly enjoyed this book and was caught up in the murder mystery and Gaskell's wonderful storytelling capabilities, but I made two mistakes while reading this book that greatly detracted from my reading enjoyment. First of all, I read the back of my copy, and second of all, I was listening to Gaskell's Wives and Daughters at the same time as reading Mary Barton. Do yourself a favor, please, and if you're interested in reading this book, do not read the Goodreads blurb or the back of the book. They all have major spoilers. Uh, they tell you who was murdered, which you don't know until page 250 of the book. My copy tells you who is accused of the crime, which is a big plot point, and Goodreads tell you who is actually implicated in the crime. Admittedly, it is difficult to explain the plot without giving too much away, but I mean, come on, I just did it, and I think I did a decent job of making the book sound intriguing. This is Gaskell's first novel, and I think it really shows. I felt that North and South and Wives and Daughters are both more cohesive and well-written novels. However, I really enjoyed seeing bits and pieces of her later works explored in Mary Barton. I can see threads of the themes in North and South especially explored in this book, and I suspect that there are elements from this book that are actually springboards for her other novels that I have yet to read. From what I've heard of Gaskell's novel Ruth, Anne Esther from Mary Barton seems to be the prototype of the main character, Ruth, and perhaps the competing love interests in Mary Barton will be reminiscent of the plot of Sylvia's Lovers. I kind of wish that I had read Mary Barton before Gaskell's other works, because while it is an excellent book, I think her other works overshadow it. I also started Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy in the month of October. I say started because I am still only about halfway through it, as you can see. I had very high hopes for this book because of its status as a well-renowned classic and one of Hardy's more popular books. A friend I took English classes with in college even said it is one of her favorite books, but I am having a very hard time getting through it. I love the way that Hardy explores themes of purity and morality, the importance of class and birth, and the issues of consent. 
but the problem with this book is that I simply don't care for Tess or any of the other characters. I think that on focusing on the concept of a pure woman, Hardy did what a lot of 18th century novelists did with their characters. I find that a lot of 18th century heroines are rather bland and have the plot happen to them rather than take an active role in the events of their story. Part of what I love so much about Victorian literature is the multi-dimensional nature of the characters. They all feel like such individual, quirky people one might encounter, rather than a type of person that many people could vaguely resemble. Dickens and Gaskell are wonderful at creating such unique characters. And the other Hardy novels I've read, Jude the Obscure and Far From the Madding Crowd, have much more dynamic characterization to them. Tess is just so moralistic and too passive for me. Every so often I'll get a glimpse of her individuality, but it's so fleeting. The back of my book says that Hardy thought Tess was his finest novel, and Tess's most deeply felt character he ever created. I thought I liked Hardy, but his thoughts on Tess are the exact opposite of mine at the moment. I feel like I need to properly finish this book to see what, why everyone loves it so much, but I just have no desire to pick it up. I did not read it in the month of November at all, and I don't really even have a desire to pick it up in December. So we shall see, but it is a book that I think I should finish eventually because I mean, it is so well known and is loved by so many people that I even trust. Moving on to the books that I read for November or nonfiction November, I started with a very timely book called The Death of Truth, Notes on Falsehood in the Age of Trump by Michiko Kakutani. I read this book right around election day and I could not have picked a more opportune time. Written by an eminent critic and former New York Times book reviewer, this book draws attention to the eerie political and cultural landscape we live in today and its connections to the thoughts of political writers such as Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism and George Orwell's works. She discusses how ideas of postmodernism, specifically the idea that there are no universal truths, only smaller personal truths shaped by social and cultural forces, have been adapted into politics. Kakutani's ideas are fascinating, and I have 11 pages of handwritten notes to prove it. I tried to get my boyfriend to read this book, and he read about 70 pages of it and then refused to pick it up again. He said that it's full of ideas that he already knows, and that while it's well written, he has actually read most of the sources that Kakutani uses and actually quotes. But not everyone has taken extensive political science classes on totalitarianism in college. I haven't, and while he didn't like the book, we agreed that it was a great primer for people like me who have not been exposed to ideas like these before. I particularly liked how Kakutani made her arguments approachable and especially relatable to the literary-minded. For example, she relates her points about the notion of truth to the controversy over James Frey's A Million Little Pieces. It was a book marketed as a memoir that turns out to be fiction. Some readers were very angry that the book was a con job and a threat to the qualities that memoirs embody, like honesty, candor, and authenticity. But others shrugged off the differences between fact and fiction. She then connected this back to the current political climate and the importance of truth versus subjectivity with regards to political office. The book is full of other literary references that are perfect analogies for the literary-minded reader. Kakutani points out again and again how the truth has been skewed and manipulated in the current political climate. Her book also discusses issues with the current two-party system, and eventually she expands her reach globally to Russia's impact in the 2016 election and potentially other elections worldwide. She warns of cyber warfare, of mass propaganda, and future technology that could show realistic videos of politicians doing and saying things that they've legitimately never done or said. There are so many interesting thoughts in The Death of Truth, but I had two major issues with the book. Issue number one, for the most part, this book is preaching to the choir. Based on the title alone, The Death of Truth, Notes on Falsehood in the Age of Trump, People who are likely to pick up the book are probably not Trump supporters and will likely already be familiar with or very receptive to Kakutani's ideas. And just in case someone unexpected picks up her book, Kakutani does a wonderful job of discouraging them from reading beyond the first chapter. To give you a sense of what I mean, the first sentence implies that Trump and the Nazi's regime are, quote, two of the most monstrous regimes in human history. 
Pakutani takes a very early, very tough stance on Trump. And while that personally doesn't bother me, I think Kakutani would be better able to disseminate her ideas on the larger global and cultural and political climate by simply skipping to the second chapter of her book where she discusses postmodernism and its relationship to universal truths. And issue number two with Kakutani's book is that those who are taken in with her ideas will ultimately question her authority and the validity of those ideas. If the truth is something that is purely subjective and has been constantly manipulated and skewed in our current cultural climate, the reader naturally begins to wonder, how do I know that what Kakutani is saying is accurate and factual? If the world is full of fake news and propaganda, how do I know that what I am currently reading is the truth? Strangely enough, Kakutani's brilliant ideas may end up undermining her own authority. Ultimately, this book was thought-provoking, and if I think about it or politics too much, I get a massive headache, so I would like to move on to some other nonfiction now, please. And then, in the last half of November, I became obsessed with learning about murder. I read The Art of the English Murder by Lucy Worsley and also Lady Killer's Deadly Women Throughout History by Tori Telfer, which I listened to on audiobook. I only started Lady Killer's after wanting to read more of The Art of English Murder while driving, and Lady Killer's was the perfect audiobook to listen to while driving. In fact, I'm not sure if I would have enjoyed it quite as much if I had read it in print. The narrator was sarcastic and witty and deftly explored a series of female serial killers and their stories. The book examines some misconceptions and tropes about female serial killers, invoking a 1998 quote from Roya Hazelwood of the FBI that, quote, there are no female serial killers. But clearly there were and there are. The book discusses how oftentimes killers were generally underestimated due to their gender and how many women throughout history used their beauty or their social standing to avoid prosecution for their crimes. It talks about the role of poison and how it is very compatible as a murder weapon with the traditional feminine gender roles. And it talks about the role that sexuality plays as well. The book was interesting, but it became a bit repetitive at times, which I frankly don't mind while driving, because I can't focus in on every single word while I drive. It started to seem, though, as if all the female serial killers were constantly switching from one marriage to the next and poisoning husbands and children. Telfer also makes the choice to focus on historical female serial killers only. The most recent one was prosecuted or died, I can't quite remember which, around 1950. This choice of dating the female serial killers, for better or worse, greatly desensitized the subject matter. Many of the female serial killers that were featured murdered so long ago that history isn't even quite sure if they were guilty of their crimes. In those cases, society's reaction to the potential female serial killer seems more interesting than the murders themselves. My favorite story was actually the first one, which has the most folklore surrounding the murderess. It's about Erzsébet Bathory, who was a Hungarian noblewoman in the late 1500s. She was accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young female servants, but more interestingly are the rumors that she bathed in the blood of her victims to remain beautiful. Her story has apparently become part of the national folklore of Hungary and is deeply entwined with vampire folklore for obvious blood-related reasons. This was a surprisingly light and humorous listen while driving to work, though, like I previously said, I don't think I would have liked it quite as much in print. The Art of the English Murder, on the other hand, is wonderful in print. I am in love with Lucy Worsley's work and the way she is once again able to bring enthusiasm to well-researched fact in her writing. The Victorian era is a great focus in this book, which makes me like it even more. The book focuses on the English fascination with murder and crime, discussing everything from the emergence of a unified English police force to major cases like the Ratcliffe Highway murders, the Bermondsey Horror case featuring Mariah Manning, the Road Hill House murder, and of course, Jack the Ripper. She talks about murder's influence in popular culture as an attraction at Madame Tussaud's Waxy Chamber of Horrors and suffused in literature of the time period, including Dickens' works. Dickens actually witnessed the hanging of Frederick and Mariah Manning, who had killed Mariah's lover and buried him under their kitchen floor. Dickens was apparently disgusted and disappointed, and his experience there at the hanging permeates his books. 
The twist in Oliver Twist means to hang for a crime, and the character of Nancy in Oliver Twist was apparently modeled off of a real person named Eliza Grimwood. Dickens also fictionalized his friend Inspector Field as the character of Inspector Bucket in Bleak House, and based the character of Hortense on Mariah Manning. Worsley examines the phrase detective fever, coined by novelist Wilkie Collins, and how the public largely distrusted the police and began to have the notion that everyone could examine clues and mysteries and search for their solutions. She discusses the birth of the sensation novel, which, much like the horror movie, was meant to make the heart race. They were set in domestic spaces where middle and upper class families believed themselves to be too grand to be investigated by the police. They brought the fear and danger of murder into the safe space of the home. Similarly, there was the idea, popularized by the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, that monsters are capable of masquerading as respectable men. The picture of Dorian Gray plays with the same topic. And then, of course, the book moves into Detectives and Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie, and it is just such a fascinating book. Worsley seamlessly blends all sorts of ideas into a well-crafted nonfiction narrative, and I cannot wait to read all of her nonfiction work. I just want to read everything that Lucy Worsley has written. So that is the end of my very, very long reading wrap-up for the fall months. My heater is kicking in again, so I'll have to shout over it for this ending here. But please let me know what you thought about anything I talked about in this video. What was some of your favorite reading in the fall months? If I have not gotten the chance to watch your booktube videos and see exactly what you guys have been up to because I've been incredibly behind in booktube. So don't take it personally if I have not gotten around to watching your videos and commenting on them as much as I usually do. And until next time, I look forward to seeing you in another video soon. Bye!